Welcome to the first uh, Sir John Monash Distinguished Lectures for 2015. The Sir John Monash Public Lecture Series provides Monash University, Malaysia, an opportunity to engage the community in Malaysia and the region through the promotion of thought leadership in key areas that are strategic to the development of this region in the 21st century. This lecture takes inspiration from the Sir John Monash, who is considered to be one of Australia's most distinguished citizen, scholar, leader, and a man who sought to use his education and abilities for the benefit of the community. The public lecture series covers a wide range of contemporary and multidisciplinary topics that will be presented by high-profile thinkers, international leaders, policy makers, corporate leaders, and leading scholars who are distinguished in their areas of expertise and whose work have made significant impact on the global community. The lecture series addresses key issues that are relevant to various stakeholders in the region on a wide range of topics including the following, sustainability, socioeconomic development, innovation and technology, health and well-being, societal transformation, Islamic economic thought and halal ecosystem, political transformation and international understanding. Today, we are very fortunate indeed to have Professor Mark Stone King, who has come for the first time to Malaysia. He will initiate the 2015 Sir John Monash Public Lecture Series on a topic entitled Archaic Genomes and Insights into Human Evolution. A few words about Mark Stone King. Uh, Professor Stone King is one of the world's leading scientists in the field of human evolution especially on genetic evolution, origins, and the dispersal of modern humans. He came into prominence for his work on mitochondrial DNA variation among different human populations. Mark and his doctoral advisor, Alan Wilson, and fellow researcher, Rebecca Kahn, made a monumental contribution to the Out of Africa theory in 1987 by introducing the groundbreaking concept called the mitochondrial Eve, a hypothetical common mother of all living humans based on mitochondrial DNA. Stone King and his team announced an interesting discovery in 2003 on the evolution of lice, kutu in Bahasa, and its relation to the origin of wearing cloth or clothes. Their comparisons from human DNA head lice and body lice, along with the chimpanzee louse, revealed that humans may have started wearing clothes some 72,000 years ago, give or take 42,000 years. <clears throat> His team has also found that human androgen receptor gene is the major factor associated with baldness in men. And he has collaborated with my group and others in this region. Mark's research has been published in international, human, uh, international journals such as Nature and Science, and he is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Stone King to the campus and Malaysia and inviting him to present his lecture for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Maud, for that very kind introduction and also for the very warm welcome and hospitality you've shown me on this, my first visit to Malaysia, hopefully not my last. Uh, I understand that there's quite a good turnout for tonight's lecture, so I will try to uh, make sure you get your money's worth. So what I want to talk to you today is about some insights we've gained into human evolution from analyses of genomes, of DNA. Now, I know when most of us think about human origins, about investigations into human evolution, the image that usually comes to mind is that of people digging up things, right? That you sit in caves, for example, and dig up pits, often in very exotic and nice-looking locations. 
And the results of all of this labor are a series of fossils that are then reconstructed to tell us something about our ancestry, as well as collections of stone tools and ornamentation and other artifacts. So these are the usual sources of insights into human evolution. But what I want to tell you about tonight is another source of insights into our ancestry, into our history, a source that um, it only started being used in analyses of human evolution oh, perhaps 30 years ago or so, but I think has arguably contributed some of the most exciting and novel insights into our history. And that is this molecule, DNA, that all of us carry within us. Now, admittedly, the work that we do on DNA is perhaps not as exotic as going off into different locations and digging up uh, fossils and stone tools and so forth. Although occasionally, if we're very lucky, we do get to go out and sample human populations for the work that we do. So now why do we study DNA to try to learn something about human evolution and human origins? Well, that's because if you think about the DNA that you have, where did it come from? It came from your ancestors. It came from your parents. And so, for example, if we take a typical family and we ask where, for example, did Bart and Lisa and Maggie get their DNA? Well, they got it from their parents, Homer and Marge. And where did Homer and Marge get their DNA? They got it from their parents. And where did these guys get their DNA? They got it from their parents, and so forth and so forth. So all of us carry within ourselves, within our bodies, within our DNA, a history of our families, going back generations after generations after generations. And so we can use different types of analyses based on this principle, for example. We can look at all of the variation that we see in a particular molecule to today, a particular type of DNA, and we can trace it back through all of these different ancestors into a single ancestor. So all of the variation that we see today traces back to just one ancestor at some point in the past. And then we can start to ask questions about where do these ancestors live? When did they live? And what, if anything, might that tell us about our origins, about our ancestry? So the question that I want to talk about tonight is a deceptively simple question. Namely, it's this question. How did our own species, namely anatomically modern humans, originate? What were the circumstances giving rise to our origins? And I say it's a deceptively simple question because when we look around the world, we see what looks to our eyes like a huge amount of diversity, a huge amount of variation in how people appear and in their culture. Their, their biological appearance as well as in their cultural appearances. And so we would like to know what is the origin of all of this variation? Is it recent? Is it ancient? How did it come about? Now, over the years, several different models for origins of modern humans, for how all of this variation arose, have been proposed. And I show you three of those here. These are the three that were perhaps discussed the most when the DNA work began. So, on the left here, you have a model referred to as multi-regional evolution, which starts with the idea that uh, something called Homo erectus spreads out of Africa roughly two million years ago. So prior to two million years, everything about our evolution is occurring in Africa. There's no good evidence that anything older than about two million years ever made it out of Africa. But beginning around two million years, we have Homo erectus, or something like Homo erectus, spreading out of Africa and all across the old world, throughout Europe, Asia, even into Oceania. And according to multi-regional evolution, all of these different old world populations of archaic humans transform into becoming modern humans. And this happens both by descent, shown by the vertical arrows within each region of the world, as well as by migrations, by gene flow happening between these different populations. And so according to multi-regional evolution, all of these old world populations of archaic humans contributed ancestry to modern human populations. Now, in contrast to multi-regional evolution, there is the single origin hypothesis, the out of Africa hypothesis, which says that yes, two million years ago, Homo erectus spreads out of Africa. It leads its descendants, archaic humans that are successful for hundreds of thousands of years all across the old world. But then somewhere around 200 to 250,000 years ago, something special happens in Africa. And that something special is us. Modern humans arise in Africa, then they begin spreading across Africa and ultimately out of Africa within the past, say, 50 to 100,000 years ago. 
And according to the most extreme view of the version of the out of Africa hypothesis, namely the replacement hypothesis, modern humans completely replace without any interbreeding at all the archaic human populations. So basically, according to this out of Africa replacement hypothesis, we are all Africans. We all come out of Africa within the past 50 to 100,000 years ago. And then there's a more sort of moderate version of the out of Africa hypothesis, which says that you know, Homo erectus comes out 2 million years ago. We have these archaic human populations spreading across the old world. We have modern humans arising in Africa 200 to 250,000 years ago. But then when modern humans spread out of Africa and they encountered these archaic human populations outside of Africa, they didn't necessarily completely replace them, but perhaps they admixed with them and picked up some ancestry. So according to these hypotheses, and there are a variety of them, but I'll just simply call them assimilation hypotheses, these archaic populations were not replaced. They were assimilated, and therefore they contributed some ancestry, some small amount of ancestry perhaps, but they contributed some ancestry to modern humans today. Now, I want to emphasize that all of these different hypotheses were originally proposed based solely on fossil evidence, not on any genetic evidence. And yet, based on fossil evidence, it's been extraordinarily difficult to try to distinguish between these different hypotheses. And I think there's a good reason for that. The reason is that you know, we don't have living, breathing, archaic humans to compare ourselves to like Neanderthals. Instead, all we have are bits and pieces of their fossils. And what we have to do is put those bits and pieces together and try to reconstruct what Neanderthals or other archaic humans look like and how they were behaving and what they were doing. And in that process of doing these reconstructions, biases creep in. They can be subconscious or they can be conscious. But either way, they creep in and they influence your interpretation of what these fossils look like and therefore what the archaic human populations look like and what they were doing. As one example of this, I show you one reconstruction of a very famous Neanderthal fossil. This is the old man of La Chapelle. It's a fairly complete skeleton of a Neanderthal. And you look at this and you see some very fierce looking hairy brutish creature and he's carrying a big club here and he's probably ready to bash in the skull of some poor modern human coming around the corner. And you know, you look at that and you say, well, geez, if that's what Neanderthals were like, you know, maybe they were your ancestors, but they weren't my ancestors. <laughs> and now here's another reconstruction of the exact same fossil. And now you see something that looks very wise, very modern, right? And he's making a stone tool, and he's obviously thinking very hard about what he's doing, and he's wearing a necklace, which is a bit fanciful since, as far as we know, Neanderthals didn't have necklaces, but never mind about that. And you know, you look at that and you say, well, gee, if that's what Neanderthals were like, then sure, I'm quite happy with the idea that they were my ancestors. The reality, of course, is that what these reconstructions tell you about is what the people who made them thought about Neanderthals. They don't really tell you very much about what Neanderthals were like themselves. So how can we go about distinguishing among these different models for human origins? Well, I would argue that the way we distinguish between them is to look at genetic evidence. Because what they really are are predictions about genes. In particular, they're predictions about what we would expect to see in terms of genes of African origin. So tracing the ancestry of the variation today, how much of that would trace back to Africa? when we look in non-African populations. And we can put this on a continuum from 100% to 0%. Down toward this end would be multi-regional evolution, which would say that yes, some of the mutations that were important for becoming modern humans probably arose in Africa and then got spread by gene flow and migrations to the other populations. But other important mutations, changes would have occurred outside of Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in the archaic humans there, in Oceania and then spread around. So we shouldn't expect to see a huge contribution of African genes to non-African populations. <coughs> At the extreme over here, we would have the out of Africa with complete replacement hypothesis, which says, well, basically, we're all Africans. 100% of our ancestry traces back to this recent African origin event and migrations out of Africa. And then somewhat closer to this end, not as far down here as multi-regional evolution, but not at completely at 100% either, we would have the assimilation hypotheses, which would say that yes, most of our genes, a large fraction of them, the majority of them, would come out of this recent African origin event, but there would be some small percentage, some contribution of Neanderthals or other archaic humans to modern human ancestry. 
So this would say that if we want to distinguish among these three different hypotheses here, we don't look at the fossils. We should be looking at the genes and seeing what do the genes tell us. Now, the first gene to be looked at in significant detail and sufficient detail to try to distinguish among these three different hypotheses is this one here. This is the mitochondrial DNA genome. It exists outside the nucleus of the cell in a part of the cell called the cytoplasm in structures called mitochondria, which are responsible for, for energy production. And this type of DNA has several unusual properties, the most important of which is that it is passed on only from mothers to their children. So all of us have mitochondrial DNA, including males, but you know, us guys, we don't pass it on to our children. It's only the mothers who pass their mitochondrial DNA on to the children. And what that means then is when we study variation in mitochondrial DNA types, um, what we're really then getting is a picture of the maternal history of humans, of human populations. So what have the females been doing during the course of human evolution? And if we look at genealogies, or what we call phylogenetic trees, but basically we look at a series of mitochondrial DNA sequences from different humans from around the world, what we see is that this genealogy or tree divides into two primary branches, one consisting only of Africans, the other consisting of non-Africans. This pattern implies that the ancestor here was indeed in Africa. And moreover, we can use a molecular clock approach. So the idea that mutations are occurring at a regular rate through time, we can ask how long would it take to produce all of the mitochondrial DNA diversity that we see in human populations today? And the answer is not very much time, only about 150,000 years or so. So the mitochondrial DNA evidence strongly suggests a recent African origin. We don't see any evidence of anything older contributing to my modern human mitochondrial DNA diversity. But that's only one gene. And the history of a single gene can differ from that of a species or populations by chance events or because perhaps selection has influenced the patterns of variation. So we need to look at additional genes, not just at mitochondrial DNA. The next gene to be looked at in sufficient detail to test these different hypotheses is this one here. It's this poor, pathetic little chromosome here. This is the human Y chromosome compared to an X chromosome. So this is what makes us males male. And it is passed on from fathers to sons. And so therefore, by studying Y chromosome variation, you learn about the paternal history of humans. Now, as I said before, in, incidentally, the Y chromosome just has a few genes on it, and these are known as the testis determining factors, or TDF genes. But recent research has revealed that there are actually additional genes that some of us may have suspected were on the Y chromosome, such as the channel flipping gene, or FLP, the ability to tell jokes, or the GOT1, <laughs> the addiction to violent movies, or T2, the air guitar playing ability, or RIF gene, the inability to ask for directions, the lost gene, the inability to express affection, or the me too gene, and of course the selective hearing loss, or aha <laughs> gene, and the inability to recall dates, or the oops gene. So now if we look at variation in human Y chromosomes from around the world, we actually see a pattern that looks very much like the mitochondrial DNA story. So we see that the deepest branches here, the earliest splits in this genealogy of human Y chromosome variation from around the world, is in Africa, so it implies an African source for human Y chromosome variation. The dates, we still don't have very good mutation rate estimates for the Y chromosome, but the dates are somewhere on the order of about 250 to 350,000 years ago, so somewhat older than mitochondrial DNA, but still within the framework of a recent African origin. So the Y chromosome also suggests a recent African origin. Okay, if we move on, we are now in the era of genome-wide data. We can do complete genome sequencing. We can look at variation across the entire genome, across all of the chromosomes that we have, not just mitochondrial DNA, not just the Y chromosome. <clears throat> and what this then gives us is a comprehensive view of all of our ancestry. And it's particularly informative for studying admixture, for studying when populations or even perhaps different species have gotten together and mated. And what we see with genome-wide data again, looks very much like what I showed you for mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome. If we construct trees now of populations based on lots and lots of variation from all across the genome, we see again this pattern of a recent African origin. The deepest splits are in Africa. 
and again, maybe 150 to 200,000 years to produce all of the variation that we see around the world today. And with genome-wide data, we can do lots more sophisticated things than simply constructing trees like this and asking how much time does it take to produce this variation. We can do simulations, for example. We can simulate different population histories and ask, what type of population history that we simulate in our computers produces data that most closely match what we actually observe in real populations today? And the answer is always an African origin. Somewhere, again, with, with splits between non-African and African populations on the order of 50, 70, 100,000 years ago. So overwhelmingly, all across our genome, there is this strong signal of a recent African origin. But, so that rather convincingly, I think, rules out multi-regional evolution, but we're left with these other two hypotheses, right? We have a recent African origin with complete replacement, or we have a recent African origin with assimilation, with some contribution of archaic humans to our, to our genomes, to our ancestry. And based on comparisons of samples from modern human populations, so from people like you and me, it's been extraordinarily difficult to distinguish between those two hypotheses. So there's been lots and lots of investigations into this. So we have this, again, recent African origin of modern humans. We have this sort of textbook view of modern humans arising in Africa, sorry, and spreading out of Africa all across the old world, ultimately into the new world. But at the same time, we have all of these archaic human populations that were living outside of Africa and in Africa at the same time. So as modern humans are undergoing all these different migrations, what are they doing? Are they admixing with these? Or, you know, what, let's face it, what people really want to know is, when modern humans came out of Africa, did they have sex with Neanderthals or not? That's what we really want to know. And again, from looking at modern human samples, it's extremely difficult to try to tell that apart. So there were studies which would argue that, yes, they did. So, for example, the eminent researcher Gary Larson published this study, which showed that the caption here, in case you can't read it, says, a stock worked frantically to start a fire. Cro-Magnon man walking erect approached the table and simply gave feet in a light. So this would suggest that, yes, modern humans and Neanderthals did have sex. On the other hand, there's also this view that he later published, showing, saying that the women here are saying they're Neanderthals and they're not every one of them, which would suggest that, no, they did not. And so, as I said, based on modern human variation, it's extremely difficult to distinguish between these. There are studies that would say yes, and then there are studies that would say no, and it's people back and forth and back and forth. What really was required and what really answered this question, I think once and for all, was the ability to get a full genome sequence, DNA sequences, directly out of fossils of archaic humans, or what we call now Neanderthal genomics. Now what makes it possible to do this? Well, what makes it possible is the ability to obtain and analyze ancient DNA. So let me tell you just a little bit about ancient DNA because it is a very different creature than modern DNA. So ancient DNA, you know, if we go to you and me, take a blood sample or even a saliva sample and isolate the DNA from that, what you'll get is lots of it. You'll get it in long, long fragments, big pieces of DNA, and it will be fairly easy to analyze. Go to a fossil and extract the DNA. The ancient DNA you get out will be in very tiny amounts, will be short fragments, so much, much less of it, and it's in much reduced in size, makes it much more difficult to analyze. It will also be damaged due to environmental mod modifications. And so you have all these particular damage points that also make it difficult to analyze. And finally, it will exist in a sea of contamination. The contamination, some of it will be environmental. It will come from bacteria or fungi, which have attacked the bone since the individual died. But there's also the possibility of human contamination from the archaeologists who excavated the bones, or perhaps from the people in the laboratory who have been handling it. So you have in, in all of these problems that you have to overcome when you're trying to deal with ancient DNA, the very small amounts, the short fragments, the damage and modifications, and the contamination. So what does it take to work with ancient DNA? It takes very special precautions that you normally don't have to undertake when working with modern DNA. So we have dedicated facilities that where the only modern DNA that gets into the facility is the person actually doing the work, otherwise modern DNA doesn't enter the facility. Everything is kept under ultraviolet light when people aren't in there to try to destroy as much contaminating DNA as possible. So it takes very dedicated facilities to do this. 
If you're really lucky, you can convince archaeologists to wear protective clothing when they do their excavations, and that makes a big difference. We've, we've done some experiments to show that the DNA that you get out when the archaeologists wear protective clothing is much less contaminated than when they, uh, when they don't. But as you can imagine, it can be rather difficult to persuade the archaeologists to don such bulky and hard to work in clothing when they're doing their, their excavations. What has really made it possible, though, to obtain full-length genome sequences from archaic humans are the advances in sequencing technology known as next-generation sequencing, you have here is a list of some of the platforms which have been developed, and this is the increase in output, and this is on a logarithmic scale. So we have gone through orders of magnitude, more DNA data that we can produce with the same amount of effort as we used to be able to produce only about 10 years ago or so. That's really is what has revolutionized the field of ancient DNA. And so <coughs> the first genome sequence that was obtained from an archaic human came from Neanderthals. It actually came from three bones shown here. These are rib fragments from this cave here. This is Vindia Cave located here in Croatia. And the bones here date to roughly about 40,000 years ago. Now the sequence that was obtained initially in 2010 was very much a draft sequence. So it was a low quality sequence. It was full of errors. It wasn't easy to work with. But nonetheless, there was enough information there to start addressing these questions about whether or not we see Neanderthal ancestry in modern humans. Since just in the past five years, there have been tremendous increases in our ability to extract DNA, to deal with contamination, and to do the sequencing, such that nowadays, given the right fossils, we can produce a genome sequence from an archaic human that by any standard you look at is every bit as good as a genome sequence you could produce from you or me. So it's really revolutionized our ability to deal with these sequences and to gain information from them. Now, what have we learned from this Neanderthal genome sequence about archaic human ancestry and modern humans? Well, there are a number of predictions we can make. And in this initial study, there were actually three different predictions that were made and tested. They all gave the same result, so I'm only going to tell you about one of them. So one prediction we can make is that if there was admixture between Neanderthals and modern humans, then the Neanderthal DNA sequence should match variants in some humans significantly more often, DNA sequence variants, significantly more often in some humans than in others. And so the way we can test this is to compare two human sequences, which I'll show, call now H1 and H2, that have different variants that we'll call ancestral and derived. And I'll show you now what I mean by that, for which the Neanderthal has the derived variant. So why is this of interest? Okay. What do we do when we deal with DNA sequences? Well, what we actually have when we see a DNA sequence is a linear combination of four letters, the four bases in DNA, abbreviated C, T, G, and A. And we can line these up between two different humans and compare each position here until we see a difference. So here we see a difference. This one human has a G in the sequence. This one human has an A, okay? And now what we would like to know is what happened. Clearly there was a mutation at some point in the past. So either A changed to G or G changed to A. But how do we tell what the direction was? How can we know what the direction was? Well, the answer is easy. What we do is we compare the human sequences to what we call an out group, chimpanzees or other non-human primates, and we ask, what is the state in the chimpanzee sequence? So for example, if we find that the chimp also has an A at this position, then what we would say is that the A is the ancestral form at this position, G is the derived, and the direction of mutation was from an A to a G. So that's how we can assign the polarity. That's how we can figure out what actually happened in the past. What was ancestral? What was derived? What was the direction of the mutation? Now, if we look at the relationships among DNA sequences and compare them to the relationships among modern humans and Neanderthals, taking two humans and one Neanderthal, we compare two humans to a Neanderthal. This is usually the expected relationship, maybe not actually in this case, but usually what one expects. The two, Neander the two humans should be more closely related to each other and then the Neanderthal, right? Now, <coughs> usually when we look in DNA sequences, what we will see is that the two humans might carry the derived allele and the Neanderthal will carry the ancestral allele, in which case we would say that there has been a mutation from the ancestral allele to 
for form to the derived form, and that that occurred somewhere on this branch, after Neanderthals diverged, before the two modern humans diverged. The other th possibility that we see quite often, again, is that we have the two humans, but then now we have the two humans with the ancestral form and the Neanderthal with the derived form. And that would indicate a mutation from the ancestral to the derived form that occurred on the branch leading specifically to the Neanderthals. And if we compare two human sequences to the Neanderthal genome sequence, the vast majority of the positions where we see variation conform to these two types. But occasionally we see mismatches, we see differences that we wouldn't expect given this overall relationship between Neanderthals and modern humans. What we can observe at some positions is that the Neanderthal has a derived allele, one human has a derived allele, but the other human has the ancestral form. Now, how does this come about? <coughs> there are two ways this could come about. One is a condition that we refer to as ancestral polymorphism, ancestral variation, variation in the po population that was ancestral to Neanderthals and modern humans. And so we would have the mutation occur before the divergence of Neanderthals and modern humans. And so in this population, we have both the A and the D forms. But then just by chance, the Neanderthal gets the D form, one human also gets the D form, and the other human gets the A form. And we can do this two ways. We can have the Neanderthal and the first human sequence having derived alleles, or we can have the Neanderthal and the second human sequence having derived alleles. So this is one possible explanation about how you can get a mismatch between the gene sequences and the actual relationships that we expect from the individuals. The other way you can get a mismatch, though, would occur under the following scenario. Here we have the two human sequences. Again, the Neanderthal has a derived allele. One human has a derived. The other human has the ancestral. This could happen also if the mutation occurred specifically on the branch leading to the Neanderthal, but then there was subsequent gene flow, admixture between the Neanderthal and this human, but not this one. And now you would get some Neanderthal alleles contributed here, and this would increase the sharing here. So how can we distinguish between these two possibilities? The answer is easy. Under this scenario, we expect the Neanderthal sequence to match the two human sequences with equal frequency. It's just like reaching into a bag and drawing out marbles or flipping a coin. It doesn't matter which human sequence you look at, they should be equally related to the Neanderthal if this is the correct explanation, this ancestral variation or ancestral polymorphism. But if there has been gene flow from the Neanderthal specifically into H1, but not into H2, then we expect the Neanderthal to match H1 significantly more often than it matches H2. So that's how we can tell the difference between these two possible explanations. And so that's the basis of the test. We compare different human genome sequences to the Neanderthal sequence. We look at these positions where one human and the Neanderthal are both derived, and the other human is ancestral and we see if there's more matching between one human and the Neanderthal versus the other human and the Neanderthal. And now when we do this for two African sequences, what we find is that there's no difference in the matching. They're equally related to the Neanderthal. We do this for two non-Africans, same result. They're equally related to the Neanderthal. Where things get interesting is if you compare an African to a non-African. And there you now see an excess of matching, a significant excess of matching of the non-African sequence to the Neanderthal compared to the African sequence. And the interesting thing is it doesn't matter where this non-African is from. Here I've shown you a French, but you could substitute a Han Chinese, you could substitute a Papuan, you could substitute a Native American, it doesn't matter. Any non-African always shows an excess of matching to the Neanderthal with respect to an African. And so we can summarize the comparisons in this way. Again, you compare two Africans, no excess matching. Compare two non-Africans, no excess matching. Compare an African and a non-African, you always see a significant excess of matching to the non-African, regardless of where the non-African is from. There are actually two possible explanations that one can come up with from this. First is that there was gene flow from the Neanderthals in early on in the ancestry of human populations after they moved out of Africa. So if human populations move out of Africa, admix, have ancestry coming from Neanderthals, and then start diverging and spreading around the rest of the world, 
then all of these different human populations are going to carry Neanderthal ancestry. So that's one possible explanation for what we see. The other one is a very sort of clunky and kind of hard to explain, explain uh, hard to, to describe explanation involving what's called ancient structure within Africa. Basic idea is that Neanderthals also came out of Africa, but several hundred thousand years before modern humans did. But if they came out of the same population in Africa that later also gave rise to modern humans out of Africa, there would be some sharing of alleles between Neanderthals and modern humans out of Africa, simply because they're coming from the same ancestral population. If that's hard to understand, don't worry about it. The statistic I showed you now doesn't distinguish between these two explanations, but other statistics do. And you do those other statistics, and they convincingly say that, no, this is not the right explanation. The right explanation, the one that explains all the data, is this one, gene flow into the ancestors of all non-Africans. So the conclusion is that, yes, modern humans did have sex with Neanderthals. Now, <coughs> during the course of this work, um, many different fossils were screened for seeing whether they would have sufficient DNA to do a genome sequence that was in sufficient shape and sufficiently non-contaminated. And during the course of this work, a small pinky bone that had sit, sat in a drawer in a museum in Russia for a long period of time, so for decades, was examined. Uh, pinky bones, fingertip bones, they don't have any um, morphology that lets you tell whether this is from a Neanderthal or a modern human or something else. So what was done was to do the mitochondrial DNA sequencing and ask, you know, does the sequence look like a modern human or does it look like a Neanderthal? And in the case of this fingertip bone, which came from this cave here, which is Denisova Cave, located in the Altai region of southern Russia, the answer was that it was not modern human, but also that it was not Neanderthal. It was something else, something that had never been seen before, never described before. And so we refer to this as Denisovans. And the mitochondrial DNA sequence compared to modern human mitochondrial DNAs and to Neanderthals here, so here you see typically what you, when you compare Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA to modern human mitochondrial DNA, the divergence is roughly half a million years ago. Here's Denisovan mitochondrial DNA. It's twice as divergent, divergent estimated a million years ago. So something very different. However, keep it all, all, on the one hand, I want you to keep in mind this very deep divergence here because that will become important later. It's also the case that, again, mitochondrial DNA is just a single gene single genetic locus, and it doesn't always give you the right answer. And in fact, when a complete genome sequence was obtained from this fingertip bone, it showed that, in fact, the Denisovans are a sister group to Neanderthals. So they have a common ancestry with the Neanderthals. Here's their divergence from modern humans. So you can see the Denisovan genome sequence is about as different from Neanderthals as, or slightly more different from Neanderthals as the deepest split within modern humans, which is between the San of Southern Africa and other modern humans. So Denisovans are a sister group to Neanderthals, but they've had a long separate history. So we refer to them as a separate group. We do not call them Neanderthals. We call them Denisovans. Everything we know about Denisovans basically comes from this genome sequence. The only fossils we have so far that have been attributed to Denisovans comes from this one cave, Denisova Cave, where we have the fingertip bone and we have a couple of teeth. And that's it. That's all we know about them. So this, though, then, having this genome sequence brings up the question, do modern humans also then have sex with any Sobans or not, right? So what do we see there? Well, now we do this allele sharing test that I told you about. And here with the comparison with Neanderthals and then with the Denisovans, we compare two Eurasians, so two people from the old world continent. We see no excess sharing, either with Neanderthals or with Denisovans. Compare uh, Eurasian to an African, we see an excess of sharing with Neanderthals. We see a similar excess, although not as extreme. If you look at the numbers here, it's slightly reduced with Denisova, consistent with the fact that the Denisovans are related to the Neanderthals. Okay, so this might be explained just by that relationship. Where things get more interesting is we look at Melanesians, people from the island of New Guinea, and compare a Melanesian sequence to a Eurasian sequence. Neanderthals, no excess sharing. Denisova, excess sharing. The Melanesian is more similar to the Denisovan than the Eurasian is. And the same thing with Africa. Now here, because we're doing a non-African to an African comparison, now we see a significant excess of matching with the Neanderthal, but it's not as much as we see with the Denisovan. 
And so the conclusion that would come out of this is that there was Denisovan admixture, specifically with the ancestors of Melanesians, which is a result I think you could have made a lot of money on by betting on after the genome sequence was produced. Because, I mean, after all, Denisova Cave is something like seven, 8,000 kilometers away from New Guinea. It's a completely different environment, completely different climate. So to suppose that you would find evidence of Denisovan ancestry not anywhere near the cave, but seven or 8,000 kilometers away was a very big surprise. But the overall conclusion then uh, is that modern humans, yes, we had sex with multiple archaic humans, hopefully not at the same time, and that we then have, as I said, evidence of interbreeding between Neanderthals, specifically in the ancestors of all modern humans. So this is our human family tree. These are the divergence between Neanderthals, Neanderthals and Denisovans, and then the modern human groups. And we have contribution from Neanderthals to all non-Africans in their ancestry, and a contribution from Denisovans to Melanesians. Now, what I want to do now is tell you about some other things that we have learned from these genome sequences. So we learn more than just the, what the sexual habits of our ancestors might have been. But we can ask also, <coughs> one thing we can ask, or that I commonly get asked anyway, what was the nature of the interactions between modern and archaic humans? Okay, yes, they were having sex, but how, what was the nature of those interactions? And some people have suggested that they were violent, or perhaps they were more peaceful. Now, from the genome sequences, we have no way of telling, right? I mean, all we can say is that, yes, they had sex. We don't know under what circumstances they did. If you look at how modern human populations behave when they come into contact with one another, I think you can make an argument for either scenario here. But what we can say from the genome sequences is that regardless of the nature of the interactions, the product of those interactions, namely the children of, of matings between Neanderthals or Denisovans and modern humans, must have been recognizably human because they must have been brought up in the human societies. Otherwise, we wouldn't, and they must have contributed to later generations of modern humans because otherwise we wouldn't see this archaic ancestry in our genomes today. If those children had been seen as, oh, you know, being something really weird, something different, or relegated to the Neanderthal or Denisovan communities, then we wouldn't see that ancestry today. So they must have been recognizably human in some form or another. Now, in addition to what we learn about the sexual habits of our ancestors, there's a lot more that we can learn from these genome sequences. And one thing we can learn is something about human migrations by looking at these admixture signals with archaic humans. So how can we do that? Well, <coughs> this is what we knew at the time of the Denisovan uh, genome sequence was published back in 2010. So here's Denisova Cave, X marks the spot. These are all the populations that were examined for evidence of Denisovan ancestry, and this is the place where you see them. Two populations that were studied, one from New Guinea and one from Bougainville. So what we wanted to do, as you can see, there's a rather obviously large gap here in the sampling is that we would like to fill in this gap and learn a bit more about what might be going on in between here. And to do that, we entered into collaboration with David Reich and a number of other people, including Maude Phipps. And there were a number of people who contributed data and samples to this study, including Kim Janam, who was a student of Maude's at the time, as well as some other people who were in my lab at that time. And so what we did was to, first of all, develop a different statistic that allowed us to estimate Denisovan ancestry as a fraction of that in New Guinea. And so here what I've done is to show you now that same, this, the same data as before, but now instead of just simply showing you red as having Denisovan ancestry and white as not having it, now I'm showing you how much Denisovan ancestry there is proportional to that in New Guinea. And the reason I do that is because in New Guinea, where you see the most Denisovan ancestry, it's only about 4 or 5%. So if I showed that as a pie here, you wouldn't hardly see it. So this does not mean that New Guineans are Denisovans. It means they have the most Denisovan ancestry. And in Bougainville, we see about 85% of the Denisovan ancestry that we see in New Guinea. Now, if you look really close, you might see some places here in some of these pie charts where you also see a little bit of Denisovan ancestry but it's in black because it's not significantly different from zero when we do a statistical test, okay? Only here do we see significant uh, estimates of Denisovan ancestry. And so now what we were able to do in this collaborative study 
is filling a lot of the gaps here. And now this is the picture that we have of Denisovan ancestry in human populations. So just to walk you through this, we have an additional population from New Guinea, from the Southern Highlands. It has the same amount of Denisovan ancestry as the other New Guinea population, so it gets a full pie. Aboriginal Australians, they have exactly the same amount of Denisovan ancestry. They get a full pie. We see all these groups here from Eastern Indonesia. They all have significant amounts of Denisovan ancestry, as do the Mamanwa, which are a Negrito group from the Philippines, and the Manobo. These are a non-Negrito group, but they live in close association with the Mamanwas. And we also see significant amounts of Denisovan ancestry in Fiji and in Polynesia, but we don't see it anywhere else. In fact, we see a very strong and striking differentiation between Eastern Indonesia here and Western Indonesia. We do not see any significant Denisovan ancestry in Western Indonesia, nowhere on the mainland. And in fact, curiously, this sort of division here comes very close to following along Wallace's old line of biogeographic distinction here. Now, many of the populations that have evidence of Denisovan ancestry we know or suspect have had contact, recent contact, with New Guinea in the past few thousand years, tens of thousands of years. Could the signal of Denisovan ancestry that we see in these populations be explained by their shared New Guinea ancestry? To address that question, we did this analysis. We looked at the amount of Denisovan ancestry on this axis and the amount of New Guinea ancestry in each population on this axis. Now, I know these are too small for you to make out what these populations are, so I'll just simply tell you that along here, we have all of the populations from Eastern Indonesia, Fiji, and Polynesia. And what you can see is that the amount of Denisova ancestry is indeed correlated in these groups with the amount of New Guinea ancestry. So that suggests that that's how they got Denisovan ancestry, not by admixing directly with Denisovans, but by admixing with New Guineans who carry Denisovan ancestry and therefore contributed their Denisovan ancestry to these populations. But there are two groups which don't fit this relationship, and those are the two Filipino groups, the Mamanwa and the Manobos which have significant amounts of Denisovan ancestry, but negligible amounts of New Guinea ancestry. So now if we take stock and try to put this all together and you know, sort of scratch our heads and figure out what this might be telling us, what we've seen is that Australians and New Guineans show the highest and similar amounts of Denisovan ancestry. So that, and that fits with the idea that they have a deep but common origin for New Guinea and Australian populations. We see that Eastern Indonesia, Fiji, and Polynesia all show amounts of Denisovan ancestry that's proportional to their amount of New Guinea ancestry, which suggests that that's how they got it, through admixing with New Guineans who carry Denisovan ancestry. <coughs> However, we have these two groups, the Mamanwa and the Manobos from the Philippines, which have significant Denisovan ancestry, but negligible New Guinea ancestry. So that raises a question. Was their Denisovan ancestry contributed by the same or different admixture event as that that contributed to New Guinea and Australia. And finally, while scratching our heads and trying to put all this together into some sort of scenario, it's important to keep in mind not just who shows Denisovan ancestry, but who does not show Denisovan ancestry in this. And two groups of particular interest that do not show Denisovan ancestry are the Jahai. Jahai are a Negrito group from Malaysia, here in Malaysia, and the Andamanese Ongan. They do not show any significant Denisovan ancestry. And this is of interest because anthropologists have proposed that both the Jahai and the Andamanese Anga are probably related to New Guineans and to the Philippine Negrito groups. And so the fact that they are possibly related but do not show this Denisovan ancestry is also of interest. So what we did next is use a method called admixture history graph, which I'm not going to explain because it's really, really complicated to try to fit a scenario which explains all of the different patterns that we saw, fits the data. And when we did this, these are the results. And as I said, it's a really complicated method and what you get out looks like a mess and it is a mess, but I can sort of try to explain it to you this way. So we start with modern humans arising in Africa and moving out of Africa. And the question marks here are to remind me to tell you that even though we, we sit and draw these arrows here on maps, we don't really know where they started in Africa. And we don't really know where they went once they came out of Africa. East Africa is as good a bet as any, but could have been North Africa. Middle East is as good a bet as any as where they went, but it could have been other places. Wherever they went, we know that they met with Neanderthals and that they admixed with Neanderthals, picked up ancestry from Neanderthals, because all non-African populations, again, show Neanderthal ancestry. 
what happened next, well, the modeling that we did suggests that what happened next was a migration that probably went by a southern route, and it came along the coast of India. And the reason why we think it went this way is because there are two populations that the simulations, the, the, the analysis shows, are descended from this migration. Those are the Andamanese Anga, so they do seem to be descended from an early migration, not out of Africa, but out of this non-African population, and the Jahai, the Malaysian Negrito group. And what happens next then is we have a split between the Philippine, Mamanwa Negrito group, and then the last split between the ancestors of New Guineans and of Aboriginal Australians. These are all suggested to be part descended from the same early migration here and to have diverged in this sort of order. And then what the modeling suggests is that there was another migration or probably multiple migrations that brought the rest of the ancestry that we see in East Asia, such as the Han Chinese, but all other East Asian groups. That, and now, again, I remind you that we have Denisovan ancestry on this side, in these populations, but not in anything on this side. And so the fact that we have the Andamanese Anga and the Jahai descended from the same migration as the migration leading to the Philippine groups, the New Guineans, and the Australians, and yet no Denisovan admixture here, Denisovan admixture here, what that suggests, obviously doesn't prove, but what it suggests is that the Denisovan admixture might have occurred somewhere around here. And that would explain why you have it here, but not over here. I mean, you can come up with other explanations and try to get the ancestry closer to Denisovan K, but it would require that you have these groups diverge, and then somehow they go up here, and they pick up Denisovan ancestry, and then they come back down here, and they don't leave any trace of it here, but you still see it here. So it gets a little bit more complicated to try to explain things that way. The simplest explanation would seem to be Denisovan admixture probably occurred somewhere around here in island Southeast Asia. And so the overall conclusion is that there have been multiple waves of migration into East Asia, the earliest one that involved some Denisovan interbreeding, later ones that did not. The most likely location for that Denisovan interbreeding is somewhere here in Southeast Asia. And if that is indeed the case, that's kind of interesting because, as I said, this is seven, 8,000 kilometers away from Denisova Cave here. And it's not only very diff uh, a wide range geographically, it's also a wide biogeographic range, right? You have Denisovan then presumably living in the you know, taiga forests of southern Siberia and the tropical rainforests of Southeast Asia. That is a wider geographic and biogeographic range than any other hominin species is known to have occupied, with the exception of us. So if that is true, and I emphasize that's a big if, but if this scenario is true, then it suggests something about the capabilities of Denisovans, that they could survive in such a wide variety of different environmental and biogeographic conditions. Okay, now that all seemed very nice and straightforward, and we were quite pleased that we gotten such a nice result out of this study. We probably should have stopped there, but you know, science continues, science marches on, you get new results, and as I said, the plot thickens. So what happened <coughs> was that early last year, complete genome sequence was obtained from a Neanderthal. So a, a very high quality genome sequence, not that, that uh, uh, draft genome sequence that I talked about from Vindia. And this actually came from Neanderthal fossils from the same cave, Denisova cave in southern Siberia. But it's Neanderthal by morphology and by genome sequence. But a very high quality Neanderthal genome sequence. And now what we find is that the interactions among modern and archaic humans are getting even more complicated than we had thought they were before. Because now if we look at modern humans in comparison to Denisovans and in comparison to Neanderthals where we have a high quality genome from this Neanderthal from the Altai, low quality genome sequences from Vindia and also from a Neanderthal from the Caucasus, from this Muscaya. What we find, first of all, is that this is not sufficient to account for all of the geno genomic variation that we see in these different um, creatures. We have to invoke something else. We don't know what it is. We call it super archaic, but we don't know what it is. But what we find is that there is, in the Denisova genome sequence, something on the order of between a half to as much as 8 percent of very divergent genomic sequence that you cannot simply account for by simple the simple ancestry here. The implication is that sometime in the ancestry of Denisovans, they had sex with something that we don't even know about, okay, and picked up this ancestry here. And then what else do these sequences tell us? Well, they tell us that there was, as I said before, 
we see evidence of interbreeding from Neanderthals into the ancestry of all modern humans outside of Africa, about one to two percent. We see evidence that the Neanderthals and the Denisovans were having sex. So there's a little bit of Neanderthal ancestry that we find within the Denisovans themselves. We also see the Denisovans uh, contributing ancestry to the Oceanian populations, as I was just telling you about, in about three to six percent of their ancestry. But now we also see a signal of Denisovan ancestry elsewhere in Asia that we did not see before. But with these high quality genome sequences, now we see this. Maybe. It's really right at the edge of what we can detect. The estimated amount is 0.2%. That's right at the edge of what we're able to, to detect with any degree of confidence. Whether this is real or not, we've been spending the past couple of months trying to investigate in more detail using more, more um, populations. And we sort of went back and forth between, yes, it's real, no, it's not real. Now, at the, currently, we do think it probably is real. And so therefore, that suggests that maybe this interbreeding that went on into Oceania might have not necessarily occurred where I told you it did, but maybe somewhere closer to the Nisova cave. We're still trying to figure all that out. But as I said, you know, the more data you get, things start to get more and more complicated. So maybe that's not so surprising, given that what, you know, what we know about human behavior and, you know, how humans like to mate and migrate, and the product of all that is the admixture that you see here. And they're getting even more complicated because <coughs> also early last year, um, Matthias Meyer was able to obtain a mitochondrial genome sequence from a hominin from a cave called Cima de los Huesos, which is in the Atapuerca region in Spain. And this is of considerable interest because this is the oldest human or homin human-like fossil from which any DNA sequence has been retrieved. This femur bone that they extracted from was dated to somewhere around 400,000 to 500,000 years ago. Very tiny amounts of DNA remaining, but they were still able to piece together a mitochondrial DNA genome sequence. What did that mitochondrial DNA genome sequence look like? Well, based on the morphology and based on the timing and where these, these, these guys are from, it was thought that they would be Neanderthals or ancestors of Neanderthals. Mitochondrial DNA says something different. The mitochondrial DNA sequence from Cima de los Huesos is actually related to the mitochondrial DNA sequence from Denisova which if you'll remember, I told you, is this really weird, very divergent type that diverged a million years ago from Neanderthals and modern humans. So what is this doing over here in Spain now? We have no clue. We don't know what to make of this. What we need now is a genome sequence from um, Cima de los Huesos so that we can see, is this really a Denisovan that's over here? Or is it something that's more Neanderthal-like that has Denisovan mitochondrial DNA? Or is it, again, something else that we had no clue existed and didn't know about? That work is ongoing. It's technically extremely demanding, but we're hopeful that in the next few months that we'll actually get some insight into what Cima de los Huesos actually is based on the genome sequence. But again, the more we do, the more complicated it gets. The other things we can learn from the genome sequences is we can get new insights into the genetic adaptations that have occurred during human evolution since humans and Neanderthals diverged. Again, I'm not gonna go into the details of how we do this, <clears throat> we can create maps where we look at the distribution of Neanderthal ancestry across different chromosomes. So I show you 20, the 22 different chromosomes here that humans have. And in red, you see the um, ancestry in Asians that comes from Neanderthals. And in blue, you see the ancestry in Europeans that comes from Neanderthals. And what you can see when you look at how it's distributed across chromosomes is that we can identify deserts of Neanderthal ancestry, so regions of the chromosome where there's no Neanderthal ancestry, even though you would expect there should be a little bit. You can also identify regions of the chromosome where you see lots and lots of Neanderthal ancestry, more than you would expect to see, given the genome-wide average. So what are these telling us about? Well, deserts of ancestry are going to be places where there was presumably selection in modern humans for genes that did not work with the Neanderthal form. So positive selection that occurred in modern humans after we diverged from Neanderthals. And then that purged all the Neanderthal ancestry. And so we can look in these genes that are found in these deserts and ask, what are they doing? And I'll just give you one example here. One of the genes that's found in one of these deserts is a gene called RUNX2. And if you have a mutation, a change that, that uh, decreases or eliminates the function of RUNX2, that results in a disease called cleidocranial dysplasia, or CCD. And some of the features of this disease are delayed closing of cranial sutures, a frontal bossing, I'll tell you about that in a minute, 
differences in the um, collarbones, the clavicles, a bell-shaped rib cage, and changes in the teeth. Now, so what are these actual differences? Well, um, what's interesting about them is that they recapitulate some of the differences between Neanderthal and modern human skeletal morphology. So, for example, one of the traits characteristic of Neanderthals is this frontal bossing, this protuberance in the forehead. It's characteristic when you find it in the Neanderthals, you don't find it in modern humans. But in individuals with CCD, you do have this frontal bossing. Modern humans have a barrel-shaped rib cage. So our rib cage goes, goes straight up and down. Oops. There we are. Um, whereas Neanderthals have a bell-shaped rib cage. Their rib cage protrudes outward as you move down the rib cage. And if you look at individuals who have CCD, they have this bell-shaped rib cage. They also have some abnormalities of the collarbone, which again recapitulate what you see in Neanderthals versus modern humans. And so the inference here is that this RUNX2 gene that we identified by looking for in these deserts of Neanderthal ancestry, changes in this gene may have been important in forming the modern human skeletal morphology relative to the Neanderthal skeletal morphology. So now we start to learn something about the actual genetic changes that were involved in becoming modern humans. Another thing we can look at is we can look at the islands of Neanderthal ancestry. We can look for places where we see elevated Neanderthal ancestry relative to what we would expect given the overall genome-wide average. And the idea behind this is that, if you, which I think makes sense, if you think about it, Neanderthals arrived, evolved from Africa. They moved out of Africa. They then had to adapt to outside of Africa, these new environments, these new climates, these new diseases, new parasites, new sources of nutrition, which they were able to do, and they were successful for hundreds of thousands of years. And then, you know, 50, 70,000 years ago, modern humans arise, they start moving out of Africa, and they have to do the same thing all over again. But if in the process of having sex with Neanderthals and Denisovans, our ancestors pick up genes that are of adaptive value that allow them to adapt to these new local conditions, then this sort of adaptive introgression will then result in signals of positive selection in the modern humans. I mean, who knows? Arguably, it could have been very important for our survival outside of Africa to have these genes that we picked up from the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. And so we can ask, what kinds of genes do we find in these islands of ancestry? And what we find, for example, are things that make sense in terms of what I've just told you. We find disease resistance genes, human histocompatibility genes, HLA genes. These you find high frequency variants that are the same in Neanderthals or Denisovans, and you don't find them in Africa, but you find them in high frequency in some populations outside Africa. <coughs> so that seems to make sense. However, some of the things we're finding, again, don't, are, are, are hard to interpret. So, for example, there was a paper published last year which looked at sequence variants in this gene, which is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes in Mexico and possibly also in East Asian populations. So there's a study focused on Mexico. And what they found is that there is a variant of this gene which is very divergent. It's very different from the forms of the gene that you find in any other human population, but you find it at a high frequency in Mexicans, and it, it is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. So the diabetes-associated form is very, very different from the forms you see in other humans. And it turns out to be closely related to the form that you find in Neanderthals. So these are the diabetes-associated forms. These are the non-diabetes-associated forms. And here we have Neanderthal sequences for this gene. So it would seem that the risk factor for this particular risk-associated gene for type 2 diabetes may have been contributed to us by Neanderthals. And even more weird is this study that came out last year, which looked at altitude adaptation in Tibetans. So there's been a few studies done looking at high-altitude adaptation in populations in Tibet, which have had to adapt to the hypoxia, the low oxygen conditions, and so forth, that go along with living at high altitude. And a few genes have been found which, for which there are variants known which confer high altitude adaptation in Tibetans. And what this study did was to ask, well, where else do you see these, these high altitude variants? And what you see is that when you look in Tibet, you have this one form of this gene, this EPAS1 gene, and we'll just call it the green form. And you can see the green form is in very high frequency in Tibet, it's like 80%, and you don't see it in hardly any other human population. Where else do you see it? You see it in Denisovans. Denisovans have this exact same form of this gene. And so that suggests, along with other analyses that were done in this study, 
suggests that Denisovans contributed this form of the gene to high altitude adaptation. So what's going on with that? What does that tell us about Denisovans? You know, we don't know. Maybe they were the original abominable snowmen. <laughs> who knows? Who can tell? So to summarize, what I think I hope I've showed you is that in addition to telling us something about the sexual habits of our ancestors, having these archaic genomes has been a source of new insights into many different aspects of our origins and our evolution, including dispersals of modern humans, migration patterns. We can find out something about the genetic changes that distinguish us from archaic humans. And we also learn something about genes of functional importance that we may have received from this interbreeding with archaic humans. Now I want to leave you with one final thought, and that's that throughout this lecture, I've been referring to what we've learned about us, about modern humans, right? And of course, that's what we're all interested in, right? We're all modern humans, so we want to know about us. We don't care about them. We want to learn about us, about our history, about our ancestry. But let's stop a minute and think about the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and maybe the other archaic types that were out there that we don't even know about. And what were they thinking? What was their reaction when they first encountered modern humans? I mean, here they'd been living in their environment and their, their, their cultures, their societies for hundreds of thousands of years. Now all of a sudden this strange new creature comes out, you know, something much different. You know, we were much more different from them than any human population is from any other human population. So it must have been something quite staggering for them to have to, to deal with these, these new arrivals on the scene. And, um, you know, there's an old saying that history books are written by the survivors, and we were definitely the survivors of that encounter. But if Neanderthals had been able to write books about what was going on, maybe they would have been something like this one here. So who are all these foreigners with small noses and big foreheads, and where are they coming from? Look at immigration troubles in the Neanderthal Valley. So, I mean, you know, immigration problems are a big issue in many societies today, many countries around the world. And, you know, maybe the spread of us out of Africa, the origin of modern humans, was the source of the very first immigration problem. So I'll end there. The acknowledgments. All of the work I'm talking about was due to the efforts of a great many people who I can't, don't have time or space to acknowledge, but I'll just mention the Neanderthal and Denise of the Consortia were led by the director of the department I am in at the Max Planck Institute, that's Svante Pebo shown here with some of the other people from the Leipzig Institute who contributed to this work. And of course, we have to acknowledge the Max Planck Society for the funding that makes all of this possible. And thank you for your attention. Now there's a chance for the audience to participate actively, all right? So this is the time when we have questions and answers. You can even make some comments if you like. I would ask that you first identify yourself. Please give us your name, um, where you're from, your institution or your profession or your interest, and then direct the question to Mark. Yes. From the Ministry of Health. Hi, Mark. Can I just ask, is it possible for us to be having Neanderthals and Denisovians walking amongst us without us realizing it? Despite uh, what some people think, that no, I think they're both recognizably different enough from us and certainly different enough from their genome sequence that that would not, uh, not uh, be, be really possible. So far, there have been a lot of different individuals surveyed for amounts of Denisovan in the Neanderthal admixture, and we don't see any really striking differences that would lead us to suspect that any you know, group is more closely related than any other. Hello, I'm from um, UK. My name is Lisa. I'm very interested in this topic because I watch a lot of TV programs on this out of Africa, and uh, we have many programs in UK. Um, can you elaborate what you, um, there were very few errors from Han Chinese. What is your take about um, the Neanderthals and the Nisivans interaction with the Han Chinese? Thank you. Okay, um, so I did, yeah, I didn't show much specifically with the with the, the Han Chinese or other East Asians and Neanderthals, but there has been some recent work which has suggested that there is a very slight but significant amount of additional Neanderthal ancestry in East Asians relative to Europeans, which again is sort of counter to what you would expect. We know that Neanderthals are, are, are mostly known from Europe, and so presumably would have had a longer period of time to interact with the, 
people living in Europe, and yet we see a somewhat higher amount of Neanderthal ancestry in East Asians than we do in, in Europeans. And, and it does seem to suggest that there was additional Neanderthal admixture that occurred in the ancestry of East Asians, including Han Chinese, than in the ancestry of Europeans. Where this additional admixture might have occurred, we don't know. Um, some of it may be due to the fact that if there's growing evidence that most of European ancestry probably does not reflect the pre-Neolithic population of Europe, but was probably brought into Europe by the migration of farmers. And so there may be some, some uh, contribution to lower Neanderthal ancestry there. But anyway, regardless of that, the, the data at the moment do suggest more Neanderthal ancestry, slight but significantly more in East Asia than in Europe. <laughs> Fascinating talk, Professor. Um, uh, I was when you were talking about collecting data, uh, collecting DNA from uh, fossils. I my my mind just went back to thinking about Jurassic Park, where it was so simple to to get um, you know ancestral DNA. Uh, mosquito sits on a draws blood from a dinosaur, goes sits on a tree, gets covered with sap, and it's preserved for a million years. Um, <clears throat> but in your case, it obviously seems quite difficult the way you've been trying to get DNA in bits and pieces and over and above that you have all this um, errors in the DNA. So I would, I would guess it must be quite a challenge to, um, to get all this DNA together in sequence. You must be looking at a lot of overlapping fragments, I guess, but getting all that must be a, a, a very big challenge. And then once you get all that data, how do you actually, um, how, how are you sure that these changes that you're looking at, point mutations that you're looking at, are actually directly an effect of evolution, or is it an error in the way you, you procured your DNA, et cetera? So yes, that's a good question. So the, um, uh, despite what you've heard about Jurassic Park, and despite publications in the early 1980s through the 1990s that claim to get DNA from dinosaur bones, from insects preserved in amber, the oldest authentic DNA that's been obtained from any fossil remains came from a study of a horse that was preserved in permafrost in Siberia, and that is about 700,000 years old. And so, I mean, given the limits of DNA preservation, I doubt very much that we'll be, ever be able to go much more than, say, a million years or so. Although, again, it just all depends on the state of preservation. So, cold and dry is much better than warm and wet. And by far the best DNA preservation is observed in re remains recovered from permafrost, so where they've been kept, kept uh, frozen. But you're right that there is a, a huge technical challenge then in dealing with the DNA sequences that, that are then generated. I mean, one of the nice features of the next generation sequence platform is that it is uh, suited to what are called short reads, so short DNA fragments. So in fact, um, it's easier to do this with ancient DNA than with modern DNA. With modern DNA, you actually have to shear the DNA to get it small enough. With ancient DNA is already naturally sheared, so we can skip all those steps. But then there's a lot of bioinformatic processing that has to go on to remove particular types of error, particular types of damage that we know about, and to assemble um, complete or relatively complete genome sequences out of these bits and pieces of, of, of um, uh, fragments. Um, but what certainly makes it uh, easier, I won't say easy, but easier, is the fact that with the new advances that have been made by people, uh, mostly at the Mont Blanc, in extracting DNA and getting DNA of good quality out of ancient material, is the generation, like I said, of, of very high quality sequences, so that you're sequencing each fragment many, many times. So you can distinguish between a, a substitution mutation which is present in all of the fragments at a position versus random changes that reflect damage or errors during this DNA sequencing process. Hello, good evening. My name is Irving and I'm a geoscientist with Petronas. Uh, I was just wondering if um, your field has any sort of uh, inference or hypothesis as to why the preservation potential of the, oh, I forget what's it called now, the, it, the one that you found in the cave, what was it again? The fingertip one? Yes. So, yeah. Why is there such a low preservation potential of that entire line of, oh, well, species, I guess? Um, so, yeah, with, there's been a, uh, a fair amount of work now since the, discover, you know, the discovery of the Denisovans trying to find other 
other examples of these other fossils, and so far they haven't paid off. We don't know why that's the case, if they were really were not very widespread, or if, again, it's just a matter of preservation. I mean, one, one hypothesis that I find kind of attractive is given that Denisovan and Sydney Neanderthals are sister groups, is that maybe when Neanderthals left Africa, or the ancestors of Neanderthals left Africa, some of them went into Europe, and those became Neanderthals, and then some of them continued on into Asia, and those became the Denisovans. Maybe where we actually have the Denisova uh, remains from the, the cave in the Altai, that might be the extreme western end of their distribution. And we have Neanderthals also in that cave, and that is, the, so far, the known easternmost distribution of Neanderthals. So maybe that was just sort of the, the very extremes of their range. Neanderthals were living in Europe, where we have caves and we have much colder environments, and the preservation is, is, more, is better. Denisovans are in Asia, where there have been warmer conditions, more humid conditions, and there have been numerous fossils that, have been, that could potentially be Denisovans that have been tested for DNA, but so far they haven't yielded enough DNA to do the, the, the analysis. But, you know, again, maybe we'll get lucky and find something, and that will, will give us more information. Hi, uh, my name is Ming. I'm from the Monash Genomics Facility. Uh, unlike we, do, we are not really that interested in human mitochondria. We sequence more non-model organism mitochondria in any case. But in any case, um, I got two questions. The first one is about this Denisovans um, admixture with human. It doesn't really make sense in the sense that if Denisovans is so far up, why are you getting it way down south? You get it in Papua New Guinea, but you're not getting it in like you know Malaysia or Asian. And another question is, is it possible that, you know, for the Tibet, they have this adaptation to elevation? Could it be that instead of uh, getting it from that in Sylvan, could it be that they kind of evolved independently? I think that makes more sense because you're not getting a lot of that in Sylvan um, uh, genotype probably in the Tibet population. So it kind of doesn't make much sense. Think of it that way. Okay, so to address the first question as to how you get Denisovan DNA specifically into, um, say, Oceania, so it's so far away. So I think there, in principle, there are two potential ways that can happen. One, as I suggested, uh, would be that Denisovans were very widespread and were living down in Southeast Asia as well, so much closer to Oceania, and that's where the admixture actually occurred. Second possibility is that the admixture actually occurred closer to Denisova Cave, and Humans spread out across East Asia and they went into Oceania. But then, and all of them then had this amount of Denisovan ancestry. But then there were subsequent migrations that came into East Asia and admixed with the populations there and diluted their Denisovan ancestry. But those additional migrations didn't penetrate into Oceania. So they didn't move as far. I mean, we do see striking genetic differences between Eastern Indonesia, Western Indonesia, mainland Asia, and so forth. So. At the moment, we can't really say for sure which of those is most likely. Now, with respect to your second question about uh, how likely is it that the high altitude haplotype uh, uh, variants actually were contributed by Denisovans, the study did a lot of, of simulations and testing to see how likely it is that you would get this by chance. And given that it's, it's more than just one simple mutation, it's a whole, you know, a whole haplotype, basically. It's extremely unlikely you would get that by chance. Now, whether that means that Denisovans were actually adapted to high altitude, or whether this was something that was just existing in Denisovans as a, a neutral variant and then got selected for in high altitude, we, we can't tell. Hello, I'm Dr. Subita from uh, the Institute for Medical Research. And um, actually, I went through this book, Eden in the East, by Dr. Stephen Oppenheimer. And, um, it, it actually points out the first human uh, civilization started in Southeast Asia. Uh, what are your comments on that? Yes, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the work of, of Stephen Oppenheimer and his colleagues who proposed, as you said, in Eden in the East, the rise of civilization, spread of Austronesian languages out of Southeast Asia. And I mean, all I have to say is that in the scientific mainstream, that's a very much a minority viewpoint that there's a a lot of evidence that argues against a role for, for the Southeast Asia as the say, source of the Austronesian expansion, the source of the rise of these, of these civilizations. Clearly, they played an important role. Um, 
but that the, the genetic and other evidence points towards origins of these developments elsewhere, and sort of spread and maturation in, in uh, uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Thanks. Uh, you said the Neanderthals also came out of Africa, is that right? That's correct. So would you have had contemporaneous Neanderthals in Europe and in Africa? Probably not, because the, the evidence seems to indicate that the ancestors of the Neanderthals moved out of Africa probably somewhere around 600, 700,000 years ago. And then they evolved to become Neanderthals in Eurasia. So you don't see anything that looks directly like Neanderthals in Africa. Instead, you see fossil forms that, at least based on reconstructions and what the paleontologists think, which you always have to take with a grain of salt, um, are, are considered to be potential Neanderthal ancestors um, so, living in Africa. So our ancestors wouldn't have lived with uh, Neanderthal ancestors in Africa? No, they wouldn't have been contemporaneous uh, at any stage? It's, so the ancestors of so Homo sapiens probably arose several hundred thousand years later, but whether and uh, what the relationship was with the ancestors, of, the African ancestors of Neanderthals is not at all clear. Um, yeah. Fossil evidence is very muddled on, on that point. And if we were able to, ever able to get you know, DNA sequence information out of some of these African fossils, then that might help shed additional light on that. But at the moment, no, we can't say much about the, what might have been going on. There is evidence, even though we don't have any archaic human genome sequences from African fossils, but there is some evidence to indicate that there must have been interbreeding that went on between in Africa between human populations there and archaic populations in Africa as well. But what those were, we can't tell. Okay. So the sex could have been much earlier and longer. Um, yeah. <laughs> as it were. Well, the <laughs> Uh, there certainly could have been, and given what we know about humans, there probably was, but the, the, the signal that we see in modern humans today, no, is, would, be, would have been derived, that, that we can actually date, that has actually been dated, and that would have occurred within the past 100,000 years. So it would have occurred after, outside of Africa. Professor Ma, I have one question. My name is Kula Sagar. Uh, did you all do any admixture study between Denisovans and Neanderthals? So yes, that has been looked at, and there is a indication of a small amount of interbreeding that went on between the Denisovan from uh, and the Neanderthal, specifically from the Denisova cave, the Altai Neanderthal. So yes, there was interbreeding that went on there as well. Would that have any significance between the studies uh, between Homo sapiens and Denisovans? Uh, did you do a comparative study? A comparative study. Um, probably not, because what we detect is a very small but uh, significant amount of interbreeding of Neanderthals contributing to the Denisovan, but then we have the Denisovan contributing to Oceanians. So we don't think that those two events are really related or connected in any way. They probably indicate separate, separate events that occur during um, human evolution. Hello, uh, my name is Raze. Um, today there are well, I think I know of two groups that are going for 10,000 human genomes. So there are going to be a lot more human data. Uh, so the question is, is there a possibility that you will discover a lost ancestor from, from this data? It's possible as we get more archaic genomes and we'll get better at differentiating between modern human ancestry and these archaic human ancestries, but it's still very, with, without the actual archaic genome, it's still very difficult to make a really solid, convincing case for this. So, um, but yes, as we do get more and more sequences, I think we will hopefully be able to to pin down uh, contribution potential contributions by other archaic species out there, other archaic groups. Well, my name is Shankar. I'm asking this question on behalf of my grandson. Uh, before Homo erectus, did we evolve from the protoplasm or the amoeba, or did the human being come in this form from another planet? I know the question is a little flippant in the light of your learned lecture, but I'd still like to know how you view a question like this. Thank you very much. 
So all of the evidence that we have points to a, a single common origin of life on this planet. So there are various sort of building blocks of life which are shared by all living things, so possession of DNA, possession of other structures, that all suggest that there was just a single origin of life, and therefore humans are descended, as are all other living creatures today, from the single origin. So there's no evidence yet, I would say, that there was any contribution from outer space or from from aliens, you know, ex no, no matter what the X-Files tells you, so. Hello, Professor Mark Strong. Uh, I'm Melvin, uh, a student here, and I was wondering, over here in Southeast Asia, specifically around the Florensis Islands, is something called Homo Florensis. Florens, I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly. You know about that, right? Yeah, and I'm just finding it on Wikipedia, basically, and uh, oh, there is no successful DNA extraction from it, but is there anything found in the genome, in the, sorry, is there anything found in the sequence around, of ethnic people around here that suggests that they were interbreeding from an unknown source, possibly from Homo forensis? So, I'm not aware of any, I mean, there is ongoing analysis. I know genome sequences from populations in this, in this area, not necessarily from directly around uh, the island of Flores, the groups on Flores. Um, so there have been some attempts to try to get DNA from, from those remains. So far they've been unsuccessful, but I know there are going to be other <coughs> attempts in the near future, and perhaps they'll, with, with new methods, so perhaps there will be, will be some success. We can, we can be hopeful. But at the moment, no, there's no indication of any, anything that we can't explain. Although, you know, one possibility I'll just throw out is maybe what we see as Homo floresiensis is Denisova. Yeah, so there, there is also some controversies uh, as to what Homo floresiensis was. Was it really a separate type of archaic human, or was it rather just a pathological modern human? Um, and there's been some publications back and forth on this issue. I certainly can't evaluate it because I'm not a paleontologist, but I talked to my paleontologist colleagues at our institute, and they are pretty unanim unanimous in their opinion that it must be a form of archaic human, that the, patho that the sorts of changes you see cannot be explained by any sort of known pathologies. And instead, there are things that, that are you know, very reminiscent of different types of archaic species. But it would be very nice to have the genome sequence, to be sure. Okay, hello, I'm James Tan from Sunway International School. My biology teachers are up there, and my mom is sitting before you. Um, so, <laughs> I'd like to ask this question. Um, I was working on a history project on Neanderthals, and I bumped to in a purported golden piece of evidence discovered this year. It was basically a cranium from like a boy from an archaic human or Neanderthal species found in a cave in Israel, and it was claimed to be the first evidence of human Neanderthal sex. Have you heard of it, and how significant would the finding be? If so, would you do any sort of research into it? Anything noteworthy of the discovery? So yes, I, I know about the remains that you're you're talking about, and you know, again, I, I think based on morphology, it's very difficult to say for sure what what a hybrid would be and what it would look like. Um, so I would want to see the DNA sequence, um, whether it will be possible to get access to the fossil to do those sorts of tests remains to be seen. Whether there will be enough DNA surviving, you know, Israel is not the best, best uh, place to look for fossils where DNA will preserve. But, uh, you know, there have been various claims of various um, findings that, that some paleontologists have suggested are, are examples of Neanderthal hybrids or show evidence of the interbreeding. But those have always been very controversial among the paleontologists. For every paleontologist who says, yes, this is a hybrid, there's another one who will say, no, it's just a gray cell Neanderthal, or it's just a robust modern human, and you see the same sorts of things in these other groups. So, you know, again, I think it, it, it will come down to the DNA evidence to, be very, to really be convincing. Hi, good evening. My name is Yao Hua. I'm a science writer. Um, do comparisons between uh, the genomes of modern humans and archaic humans give us any idea on how our ancestors outcompeted the, ar the archaic uh, humans? Because supposedly, um, if we had retained adaptive uh, 
function of genes from them, from Neanderthals. They, they must have, I guess, taken some of our adaptive genes too, unless you know, our ancestral mothers only mated with their men and their women did not mate with our ancestral fathers. So there's sort of you know, two schools of thought as to what, what led to the success of modern human, well, several schools of thought, I should say, over what led to the success of modern humans. The genome sequences at the moment don't give us any clue, but that's because we are still just beginning to figure out and understand how to go from a genome sequence where we see a particular mutation change to understanding what that mutational change might actually be doing. So, I mean, that's sort of one of the big questions now in human evolution. We can identify all these changes at the genetic level, but knowing which ones are important, what, the, what those changes do in terms of um, their effect on the humans as a whole, and what they may have been selected for, we have no idea. So there's some people who think that, yes, there must have been some important mutation that occurred to make us modern humans that gave us this competitive advantage over Neanderthals, you know, whether it was language, whether it was our social skills, whether it was cognitive abilities, we don't know. Um, by every measure that you can get, by looking at cranial morphology and skeletons, there's no indication that Neanderthals had any decrease in cognitive skills, any difference, um, significant difference. If anything, their, their brains were larger than ours. So there's, but there's one school of thought that says there must have been some sort of fundamental human mutation that, that made us what we are and that made us able to outbeat Neanderthals. There's other school of thought which says, well, it could have just been wholly accidental. Um, that it could have been that modern humans, for example, were simply better at getting resources from the environment and outcompeted the Neanderthals, especially if this was a time when populations were under stress. So it's been shown by modeling that if Modern humans were more efficient at getting resources and outcompeted Neanderthals, and resources were limiting. Neanderthals would have gone extinct over a few, period of a few thousand years. Um, then there's another school of thought, which I actually find most persuasive, although again it's all speculation, would be that it's maybe in the disease played a role in this. That maybe modern humans brought with them some some disease that they were resistant to, but that the Neanderthals were susceptible to. And you only have to look at what happened in in the New World with the arrival of the Europeans to realize just how powerful uh, diseases can be in this sort of thing. I mean, arguably, Native Americans could have gone extinct without the intervention of, of modern medicine. And so if something similar had happened with modern humans bringing some disease out of Africa with them that the Neanderthals were just susceptible to, that could have played a big role in the success of modern humans as well. So, yeah. Um, with that, I think we bring this session to a close. We'd like to thank you very much for your questions and participation. And uh, Professor Stone King, I suppose if you've got really burning questions, you could sort of ask during dinner, or you could probably email him at uh, Max Plunk if he doesn't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, dinner is outside, and you're all invited. Thank you. Thank you.